Institute. I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that Togi has done on university lands, as well as university lands and vision in the future to develop technically sound analysis to improve the reserves or how to address to other operators on business impacts, business development, and future field development in the Permian Basin. And the main driver for this technical analysis or for this vision comes from the large push of data acquisition from many operators on university lands. So just a show of hands, who is an alumni from UT or, or Texas A&M? Yeah. Awesome. And y'all are aware of university lands or understand where they, so I don't have to give too much of an introduction on that. But I'll go ahead and just give an overview on what we do on, on university lands. Primarily, it is oil and gas production now towards the UT and Texas A&M schools, but there are about 2.1 million acres and about two thirds of them are leased out to oil and gas operators. And the university lands dates back from about the 19th century where the Texas government wanted to allocate lands in West Texas in which the revenues would benefit the flagship school, University of Texas. And then later on, it was split up to where one third of the contributions go to A&M and then two thirds goes to UT. Oil and gas production wasn't at the forefront until the 20th century with the Santa Rita number one. And then since then, we've had about 20,000 wells that are, that are producing or that are on university land, 9,000 of them, which are currently being produced. And then we still have a lot of drilling potential around 21,000 wells or units that are, that are left to drill. As far as surface activities, along with the oil and gas production or with, with surface facilities, along with pipelines and power, we do have some farmland. There is a push, especially from the UT system, to allow some acreage for, for renewable energies, so for your wind farms. We do have our own wine and our, our, for vineyards, and then of course we have our own airport. And I come from the Houston office and city center. But we are, our main office is actually in, in Midland, Texas. And as I mentioned before, that all this revenue or the royalties that come from the oil and gas production contribute to the UT and, and Texas A&M school systems. So that's where UT and A&M is getting most of its money. As far as the advantage on university lands, especially the push for data acquisition from, from different operators, and then even within initiatives of, of companies of, of gathering so much data, uh, gathering a lot of data to understand the subsurface a little bit better, especially in the Permian. Some of the advantages that we have on UL is that we are the largest, most concentrated acreage in, that is prolific to the Permian Basin. So this is Midland, Delaware Basin, the Southern Delaware Basin part, and the Central Basin platform. We have, as I talked about, 9,000 wells that are currently being produced, and then alone out of those 9,000 wells, over half of them have been drilled since 2009. So while this, these lands are, while we've had horizontal since the 1920s, since 2009, we've actually had half of those wells that are drilled for, from, for on university lands. And this is including 1,700 on conventionals, and we have around 300 acre, or 300,000 acres that are left to be drilled for, for, for horizontal well development. And Along with operators, or with respect to each operator, we want to develop the best practices after comparing different operators on university lands. So it's not using the public data sets, it's actually using some of the data acquisition or some of the data that, that the, the companies themselves collect. And then as a university lands organization, we get access to that daily production, daily pressure data to, to determine what are those best practices. We are able to do well by well studies in, for comparing different and it doesn't also come from us. We're not going to be the only ones addressing these best practices. What we encourage is that if there are operators that have leases that are right next to each other, we want to encourage that collaboration or that conversation uh, on the university land acreage. I, taught, I gave some brief notes on, on some of that advantage, but here are our main bullet points of what we want to do in the future. We want a commercial, more forward-looking culture, which means that we want to share best practices, not only coming from university lands, but it's also coming from the operators themselves. We want to increase the internal knowledge of our research potential, so it's not just improving the reserves that are on university lands, but also look at some of those prospective resources or looking at underdeveloped, unconventional reservoirs on, on university lands that companies that are already, being, are already testing but if they're on university land acreage, we want to be a part of that forefront of, of that development. And we'd also wanna work with our partners in creating value through diversifying and incentivizing 
The incentivizing not only comes from royalty relief for feet, more increased field development for, for different university land operators, but we also have business in the midstream. And then, and then I mentioned before, as far as the UT systems push for our renewable energies or for acreage for, for, for renewable energy, we are in the process of developing more solar, pa solar panels and more wind farms. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the UL organization structure of how that's benefited the, the technical development or that technical focus. I'll save questions until the end of the presentation, please. So this is the general structure for, for university lands. I, I talked about UL and then I talked about the two main offices being in Houston and in Midland. We constantly have acreage that is for sale due to the increased amount of activity between operators that are on university lands. Out of the 2.1 million acres, two thirds of them are leased out or that have, uh, that have wells on, on location. The other one third are, are always up for, are, are for sale along the Central Basin platform. And then the main push for a technical focus or for improving the reserves comes from our UT System Board of Regents and our advisory board. I'm not gonna go block by block as far as what the change or the focus or the technical focus of the university land organi organization or structure goes. But what differentiates the, I guess what differentiates the maroon from the burnt orange here is that these new organizations that are in maroon are representing the new organizations that will be driven towards data acquisition incentives from university land operators the mandate to get daily data, daily pressure and daily production data, as well as the, the, the surface data that we've traditionally had on university lands in order to perform our, our subsurface studies. While there is a while there is an involved structure for, for technical focus, I'll give more I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the role of what we've done at Texas Oil and Gas Institute because that is that's been the recent initiative to gather higher resolution data from, from university lands. Traditionally, UL has gotten monthly production data and that's coming from public data sources and the most of the data that we've gotten were from surface facilities, but there hasn't been a push for what additional data sets do we need to confirm reserves with reasonable certainty on, on university land. So this is the permanent university fund, the PUF and then the AUF, the available university fund. The difference between those two is that AUF just represents the certain taxes or the revenues that come from the surface facilities. Permanent university funds is the actual production. I can't release what's happening for, or what are the reserve amounts for, for 2017 yet. We're a couple months shy, but here are some of the total net reserves that we have as, a, as of a couple of years ago, or that we determined as of a couple of years ago. The gross daily production, we're including oil and gas production, especially with higher gas production in the Southern Midland Basin, is, is around 203, or 203 MBOE per day. And then this is our net daily production. As well as the revenue, this was our revenue from, from 2016, but the push for developing Texas Oil and Gas Institute, and I'll show on a later slide, was that we could get revenues as high as up to $1.2 billion. So this is the historical projection of West Texas Intermediate Oil Price versus the available university funds and then the permanent university funds on, on university lands. The ramp up and then the, and then the uptick in oil price or with high oil prices in 2014 has, incur or has improved the potential for contributions on university lands of about 1.2 to $1.3 billion. However, even with uh, even with your, your compromised oil prices or even with the suppressed oil prices, we still have a lot of contributions coming from different operators on, on these university land wells with, with, with respect to oil price. So the unconventional reservoir development has been extremely important and then to develop our understanding of how to optimize that production, maintain that production from, from different operators on university lands is, is very important. I mentioned about the vision, but these are our key takeaways from the strategy that we want a commercial forward-looking or forward-looking culture. And we've done that from the UL organizational structure. And then we've also done that with changing the monthly data acquisition to the daily data acquisition and with pressure data, if there are measured pressure or if there is measured pressure from, from the operators themselves. And then of course, collaboration with, with different operators, not just 
you well talking to individual operators, but operators talking amongst themselves if they have neighboring acreage on university land. And I did talk about the organizational structure, but some of the new organizations or some of the new teams that are developed to, to focus on, on, the, on the technical development or how to improve reserves. And the answer for all of those objectives or how to achieve all of those objectives is, is the data. This is where Texas Oil and Gas Institute comes into place. With the ramp up in unconventional reservoir development as of a few years ago, having revenues to about $1.2, $1.3 billion, TOGI was created by the UT Board of Regents to have a technically focused team in reservoir completion, production, engineering, and in geology to get a better understanding of, of the subsurface. So we do a lot of look back studies. I work on the production engineering side, so I've done a lot of look back studies with respect to artificial lip, well bore modeling, and determining underperforming wells. So if you do have any questions in your capstone project about any of those topics, feel free to talk to me and I will answer <laughs> as many questions as you want. I have a couple Urtech papers that I hope you that, that I hope you guys could take a look at. And I have a documentation slide at the very end. So along with the subsurface evaluations, we're not doing this in a silo. We're also going back to these operators and showing with all of the operators that we've gotten daily data from, this is our comparative analysis on what's your optimal well spacing, what is a, you know, what are some of the optimal landing zones that other companies that are doing right now that are right next to you, and here's the artificial lift strategy that, that these companies are doing, and they have a slightly better MTV than you do, or their LOE is a lot lower than what yours is. So that we go back to these operators and tell them that this is what you, these are opportunities of improvement even though you, you all are doing great. And when I say that there are companies that are, that are doing great, I mentioned about there, there are numerous operators on university lands, but there are about 40 super majors, large independents and small independent companies that, are, that, are, that make a distinction and that make most of the production on, on university land wells. And we primarily go to them since they have the, the majority of that acreage or at least contingent acreage. And finally, you probably have seen some interns from, from UT and A&M that have had internships throughout their spring and uh, throughout the spring, summer, and fall. But we do take pride in educating interns from, from Texas Oil and Gas Institute. We're a lean team of six to eight people. And with 9,000 wells to deal with that are currently being produced, and with 2,000 wells that are horizontals, and if we're going to do unconventional studies, then the, the ones that do have the initial access to that data, or at least doing a lot of the data mining, comes, comes from our interns. So we're outnumbered by them every, every semester. In addition to having interns in our office, some of the benefits that these interns have is that they do go to field offices with respect to the company, so they could do direct company projects that are funded by TOGI. So the, the company has an additional intern, but they're, they're getting more work done in the permian. I did talk about how there are other sources of revenue from university lands that are contributing to the AUF or the Available University Fund, but we do have midstream, we, other sources of business from, from UL is, is the midstream side. And then I talked a little bit about royalty relief from, from for, for operators. If a company were to come up to an operator and request for royalty relief due to suppressed activity, what University Lands could do is based on our recommendations from Texas Oil and Gas Institute, we influence University Lands to provide the royalty relief for these companies, but in exchange of having a couple extra rigs on the lease. Mm -hmm. Or here's, what you can, here's how you can improve your well spacing, or here's how you can tighten up your, your well spacing. And you still would be able to get a lot of revenue with respect to the company if you, and if you were to apply these recommendations but that's in exchange for this is the royalty relief that you've asked for. <coughs> so therefore, UL and TOGI wants to advocate for investments of full field development. And it's not just by trial by error. The reason why we're doing these look back studies is we're also encouraging technology investment. You've probably heard a lot about DAS, DTS, and then even adding a near bottom hole pressure gauge uh, to, at, the, at the kickoff point or uh, even along the lateral for, for some of you all is very important. When recruiting at UT and a and we show this virtuous cycle <coughs> amongst the, for, 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 for the student chapters, but this should give you a really big, or a good big picture idea on how we integrate TOGI with, with university lands. So you have about 1.4 million acres 
that are leased out are that are leased out for oil and gas production. We have about 287 operators that are producing from these lands. These operators are very integral to improving the reserves and the production on on university land. And Toki comes into play where we have access to all of the well data, higher resolution data compared to monthly data in the past to do our completions, reservoir and production engineering correlations. And then that contributes to getting a better understanding of how all 9,000 of our wells are, are, are performing. And that also includes your, your unconventional wells. And finally, when, as I mentioned about the, the interns, we do take advantage of not just recruiting interns from the universities, but we take advantage for, of, of the research institutions that are already available from these two universities, with UT, the BBG, and then with Texas A&M, the Berkeley's the Christian Institute. A lot of their research showcases do come from the university land operator data. This is some of the progress that we've done within the first year. Since there's a lot of data to mine, and since we had our initial intern class thrown to the wolves to, to figure out optimal data mining techniques, this is what they've done to date. For instance, out of the 9,600 wells and out of all the operators, and then about over, over 2,200 modern wells, meaning recently completed conventional and unconventional wells, we've had about 800 of these wells that, that we have actively in our database that have daily production and pressure data. This is representative of about 40 to 50 or, or operators that are on, on university land. And then we are continuing to work with these operators to update the production data, to update the pressure data, to make sure how much our GCAs have been changing, our decline curve analysis, or how our EURs have been changing. Have we overestimated them with more than six, or with at least six months worth of data? And this is an advancing technique, or this is something that we're doing as far as as far as database storage, but we have been dabbling a little bit into machine learning for different post-frac reports. How do we get the parameters do we want from completion reports that are not easily digitized? So and how do we automate the, the correlations between your, your specific completion parameters and then, and then your production, your, your, your initial production, your IP, your, your 30 day, your 60, and your 180 day. Some beginning methods that we've been doing before we had our full infrastructure, we did do some statistical analysis between your completions and your and your production data. I mean, we do start with your DCAs initially if you don't have if you only have the production data from from that company, and then when you have your flow and bottom of pressure data, that's when you start running your RTAs. And then, if the company doesn't have reservoir simulation or doesn't have an active reservoir simulation team, we build up those single well, multi well models and go back to the operator as far as here's what your numerical simulation says. And that's how we would derive your, your best practices out of that. As far as advanced methods, I talked a little bit about numerical simulation, but that also goes back to frac modeling as well. And then that if we have the stress data, we've, we've recently developed a couple frac models to develop best completion practices or, the, your, or your fracture propagation. And then we are continuing to use analytical methods for the, for the value of information or assessing how valuable is the information that we're getting from, from the companies themselves. Another cycle that we want to talk about is while we are looking at well by well case studies, this eventually goes back to your, your field optimization. So these are the ranges of value adding projects that toby has been doing from your reservoir completions and then the production engineering side. What we've done as of the first year is as I've mentioned, we've developed a couple fracture models and, and we are continuing and we're continuing to look at what is your optimal well spacing, integrating our geo model or, or, or geo modeling on that. And finally, I, and I can talk a lot more about this is using a long term approach for artificial lift optimization. So you're not looking at your first artificial lift installation, but you're looking at how many installs do you need? What's going to be that time step at which you install? What's that minimum flow and bottom flow pressure you can draw down? And then ultimately, out of all of those cases, what's going to be your high, what strategy would yield the, the largest EUR and, and your optimal NPV? The good thing about Togi is that we've had the access of all student licenses of, of Schlumberger software. Interns can go work for companies full time, having the knowledge of the industry software rather than undergoing the training. 
And as a staff, we've had we've continued to, to keep up with the, with the practice of, of the shoulder vision software. I'm not a geologist, so I or a petrophysicist, so I can't speak too much about the, the petrophysics or, or the geology here. But this is just some of the petrophysical work that we do have in or that we, we have the capability of doing to identify your landing zones or to identify potential on, on university land wells. And if you don't have that much log data for your unconventional reservoirs, or if you don't have that much log data within, within, an, uh, within a section, we go back to these operators and request that if you could, if you, if you could get some of that log data. Or, the, or, or, or then we'd have, to, or we'd, have to work on, we'd have to work on developing analog, or, or identifying what are, those, what are those optimal analogs. This is another project that we've done on university lands, which is identifying your optimal artificial lift strategy. This just sums up of combining your reservoir performance over time, so the IPR curves are generated from your numerical simulation, and then the outflow curves, which are just running BFP tables using PipeSim or using, uh, or using Prosper. And then you'd identify the optimal, you'd identify the optimal operation point each VFP table represents an artificial lift that you run the VFP table for under certain conditions, whether if it's your ESP or your gas lift. And a set of VFP tables represents your, it represents one artificial lift strategy. And then the switch from one VFP table to another is based on your liquid rate. So you get to look at from your reservoir simulation and you run different cases on when are you switching from your gas lift to your rod plug? Are you switching from your ESP to your gas lift? Could you draw down enough? of your, could you draw down enough from your ESP or could you draw down enough with your gas lift with a common injection rate? This is how we've integrated some of our geology or geologic models with our, with our reservoir simulation. I added these on the backup slides, but what we've done so far for our lower sprayberry is that we've been able to develop a geologic model for, for our lower sprayberry and for, and for our wolf camp B. Some of the findings that, we, that, we've, that we've been able to that we've that we've gotten out of that out instead of instead of assuming certain geologic properties, is that the the, the to answer the well spacing question or to answer the potential from from a single well analysis is of course a lot more complicated, but this is some of the progress that we've done from from developing our, our geologic model. We've been successfully able to do that after two years of of acquiring data and getting a better understanding of the geology. On, on university land wells to where we've developed our geologic models in the lower Sprayberry and in the Wolf Camp B. And when I say the Wolf Camp B, I'm talking about in the Southern Midland Basin, so your Reagan and Upton counties. And then for your lower Sprayberry, Andrews County. So some of the questions that you'd ask, that industry asks all the time or corporations ask all the time are the answers that we've been trying to figure out and here are all the projects that we've completed to date with respect to what location they're on, on university land. So we've already done our basinal study or we're working on our basinal study in the Delaware Basin. We have talked a lot about artificial lift optimization but these were our primary candidates in the northern and in the southern Midland Basin. We are looking at a well-built orientation study for getting more stress data in the Delaware Basin. If you go to the University Lands website and if you look at the horizontal well placement, you'll notice that the orientation within University Lands on Area 2, we call this Area 2, is different compared to what's outside of, of University Lands. Many operators mention that it's because of, of the lease line restrictions and Instead of instead of your instead of the traditional well bore placement, or if you are if you are placing your your horizontal well along the strike, but those are some of the questions that we're trying to answer. Is that is that different well bore orientation, or is the discrepancy of the well bore orientation coming from the mechanics, or is it coming from from land? And then which wells are doing better, inside or outside of university land? And then as I talked about, I'm looking at underperforming wells. Out of all the unconventional wells on university lands, I've been generating type, or we've already generated type curves on recent wells that have had high completion intensities. And then we compare that to wells in the past that have low completion intensity, so less sand and less fluid pump per, per lateral foot. And then based on, and then by, if they, if they underperform by more than 20%, can they be potential lease-in candidates? Is that economic? And finally, we're looking at resource assessment for prospective reservoirs that are on that are on university land since we own all the all the mineral rights. 
but there are companies that are out there that are testing in, in deeper reservoirs. I also did some work on the lateral links of how your toe up, your toe down, or your undulating wells affect your production over time. So we're isolating the completion and the geology landing, or, or your landing zone, and, and we specifically look at how, to what extent is our well bore hydraulics affecting your production over time. And then if you are to double your lateral length, what you'll find in industries that there, especially in the Permian, is that there's a push for longer laterals. But if you were to have, if you were to, if you were to drive or increase the, the lateral length, would you have an, an incrementally higher EUR? These are some of the projects that we're looking at right now. What you'll notice on, on university land wells and really anywhere, since it does cost a lot for, for getting some of your PVT samples, there's a dearth of PVT data on, on university lands. But we are running a study right now on to what extent are initial conditions of our PVT affecting your reservoir performance with respect to different locations in the northern and in the southern Midland Basin. And then we are continuing our geomodeling once we get more of an idea of, 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 generating, of generating our stress data. As far as our petrophysical analysis, we're, we're using, uh, we do use other companies from, that, that other operators that are using for, for our petrophysical analysis, and then our, our core studies as well. And then, of course, we are advocating for more technology investment or more observations on, 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 these, on these university land wells. You'll find that there's a lot of operators that do not, uh, is, there's a lot of operators that may not have the infrastructure for, for monitoring some of this data real time. And what we hope to do is collaborate with these operators and at least initially invest in that infrastructure. Or if they don't have software packages for Petrel or reservoir simulation or fracture modeling, we could do that work for them. I did talk about some of the progress work that we've done on, on university lands, but this has been a particular area of interest for us because we have poor performing wells and we have many operators that are moving out in that, in that part of, of, of the Southern Midland Basin. Primarily because what you'll find in the Southern Midland Basin is if you focus on this and in, 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 it's a part of your career, there, it, it produces a lot more gas and the optimal artificial lift has not been, has not been the best in, in the past, which is why you have a lot of operators that are, that are moving out in, in this particular section. So some of the questions that we're trying to answer is how do we maintain the operators that are producing on those lands right now and what have they been doing to still remain economic? And this is some of the workflow that we've gotten in whenever we run uncertainty analysis. In reservoir simulation, there's never going to be one answer based on the inputs of, of, your, uh, of your reservoir parameters, and especially when you're developing uh, your enhanced zone and then your matrix and then, and, then, and then your fracture properties. So these are the ranges of property. We would get a range of values for each of these properties, and then we end up running our uncertainty software from, from Schlumberger. And then we'd also have, we've also written a script to export all of that uncertainty on on, in spot fire. And this is combined, and of course, when you're running your uncertainty analysis, you're running your, 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 you're running your reservoir simulation. But in the next slide, you'll probably find the ranges of results that you could get as far as answering a, what, what potential you can get out of, out of an average well. And that's how we generated our type curve for, for these unconventional wells. So this is the answer as far as the, the ranges of uncertainty that, that we've developed by, by, by this workflow. And this is just some of the, this, these are just some of the results that we would get assuming a common lateral length on, on, on university lands. And this is something that we, that we typically bring back to operators like, here's an uncertainty analysis that we've run. Here's the average lateral length that you have on, on, on the section. And this is a range, this, these would be the ranges of results that you, that you end up getting. Of course, when you're screening out some of this uncertainty, you're going to screen out the, the wells that just, that have all of the worst parameters which may not always happen, or all of the best parameters, or the higher ranges of, of your matrix permeability or your frac permeability, or, or with tighter cluster spacing, that doesn't always happen. So we end up narrowing down to what we think is our, is our PVT. Other questions that we're trying to answer, what you probably would answer if you're, if you're working in, in industry, is the, 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 your best completion technique. 
So we're trying to figure out the, or how to optimize traditional completions. If we're tightening our cluster spacing, is tightening our cluster spacing necessarily the, the answer to improving your production on, on, on university lands? Are we definitely maximizing your, your SRV? Or are we getting, are, 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 we, reaching our, are, are we reaching our matrix with, with, our, with our completion strategy? And this just gives you the evolution of how we've tightened up our cluster spacing, but we, when we ever were generating a frac half-length in our RTA, we also know that frac half-length doesn't represent throughout the lateral length. It's a normalized value. You'll also find that there, what we've also, what we've looked at is how to, uh, it is in limited entry, or instead of plug and fur, how do we target some of our completions, or how do we target the fluid in the sand pump? And is that type of completion strategy versus your plug and fur more effective? There are there are in-house studies that are done within within companies, and then we've been doing that in Toji as well by comparing what different companies have been doing if they use those two different strategies. I'm not going to go line by line of some of the documented work, but all the slides that I showed to you are rep far or all the information that is that's in detail from from these Urtech papers. Have you guys gone to Urtech or have you guys gone to any of these conferences that I, that I put up up here, the FRAC conference? Well, I, I will say that we've been published quite a bit from, from everything that we've done on, on, on university lands. And this is just some of the documentation that we've gotten to date. As far as some of my publications or if you wanna ask me more in detail of, of some of the work that I've done, I did talk about artificial lip, so this is the paper that I that I led, and then this is also the paper that I've uh, that I've been involved with. So production optimization and then an artificial lip. But this ranges some of the look back studies that we've done in completion, in reservoir, and in, in production engineering. I couldn't give specifics on what's that optimal RTA or what's that what's the frac half length that we've been getting from different unconventional reservoirs, but hopefully the workflow, the transition from getting that high resolution data to the technical analysis that we've been getting gives you an idea of some of the impacts that we've been able to provide to university lands and then to operators that are active on university lands. And one thing I would leave with you all, since this is a student symposium, is that we, we, did, we do take pride in our education. A lot of the documented work, we've had a lot of students that do with the data mining, and then we had students that have been integral to, to, to developing the paper. So as of the past two years, we've had about 90 interns. We do have 10 this semester. And we've had a great placement record, meaning I'll show another slide of all the companies they've gone to. And I've mentioned about while we've had most of our interns in the Houston office, some of them do have the opportunity to go to some of the field offices in Midland and, Houston, and, and, and uh, corporate offices in Houston. Each of these interns have had access to student licenses of industry software, so they've come to, to companies working full-time hitting the ground running. And then this really is in response to uh, suppressed oil prices because when with with the competitive environment of getting internships and full-time positions it can be tough trying to maintain your learning or maintain your industry knowledge togi has bridged that gap by having a lot of these interns and having them trained up on on industry software and industry insight from from the staff that have worked with these companies in the past if you have alumni or if you have if i showed a slide before about all, all the interns that we had in our inaugural summer 2016 class. We've had quite a few since then, and we've had, and this has been our placement record to date as far as where they've gone, where they've been, and who they've been hired by. So they've ranged from large operators, super majors, and then even to other mineral rights companies. Thank you all, thank you again for the North American Student Symposium for giving me the platform to talk about university lands and. Hopefully this does clear the confusion on how does UT and Texas a and make so much money <laughs> and then what is Texas Oil and Gas Institute. So thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes. Would, would I be allowed to email you regarding my capstone project? Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. I had a quick question. So you, you mentioned a lot of the analysis that Toby does is about to be trying to optimize and, and select better completion plants or artificial lip plants on an uh, inacronomic basis, right? Like an APD basis. Yes. Are you doing your own in-house economic analysis? 
companies or any kind of reliant on like cost models provided by operators or they're, how do you manage that? They're cost models that are provided from that are used on university models. Okay. So we have in house cost models. Mm-hmm. Right. And especially with artificial lips, since we haven't had the since we haven't had like a, a set cash flow model on that, we would use some of the cost data from with respect to the operator. Any other questions? Okay. Go, you go ahead. Uh, I just have kind of like a, I guess maybe like an organizational question. With all the softwares that y'all have exposure to, is it really like any sort of big challenge to try and learn that software? Uh, at the time that you're with University Land? What we found is that interns were really good at learning or at <laughs> self-teaching mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they were they were they were able to pick up the software faster than we can arrange the training for them. Okay. We've we've had training we've got the training from Schlumberger like we've we've reached out to Schlumberger and we've we've trained but even just playing around with with the software and googling it or going on one touch or they they figured it out. <laughs> But we've also had people on staff that have had previous experience with the software. Mm-hmm. So we've run workshops on that. Okay. You had a question before. Yeah, I have a couple questions. So well, I, this is the first I've heard of this program. It's pretty interesting. So, so it sounds like you guys work pretty closely with the Texas universities. So you you guys like provide data and stuff. They can run research and learn from that? Or how, do, how does it work? Really? The, we don't provide the data uh-huh. to UT and A and M schools, okay. but it would have to come from the operator. Okay. There have been conversations, if it is involving university lands, it would be university lands being in those meetings with the operator and then with the research institution because we did promise the research institution that we provide provi- provide some of the some of this data. Okay. If it's public data, yes. The if it's public data that that was provided to university lands, then directly the, 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 those the schools can, can make use of it. But if it's higher resolution data, for example, if it's measured data such as pressure, then we have to involve the, the company as well. Okay, so the year tech papers that you're talking about, those are published works that anyone can yes, look at? Yes, that anyone can look at, Okay, right. And um, can you know why you guys, you talked about um, looking at the geomechanics and well performance. Why did you choose the Delaware Basin? Do you know about that? In the, it came back from our well bore study. Mm-hmm. What we found pretty shocking, what we found pretty shocking, well, in the, in the Midland Basin, we found it to be pretty consistent mm-hmm. between on UL acreage and outside of UL acreage with the Northwest to Southeast orientation. Mm-hmm. But in the, in the Delaware Basin, it, it is different, but within university lands, that orientation varies. Mm-hmm versus outside of the Delaware Basin, the orientation is, uh, it, it is pretty consistent. So that, 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 was one, that was one of the main drivers for us to, to focus on the Delaware Basin. The other one is the Delaware Basin, from what we've seen in the past when we worked for or we, the, the companies before, before Toby, is that it's, a, it's, an, overpressured, it's an overpressured basin for, for unconventional reservoirs. And to choke back our wells or to draw down our wells before putting the wells on an artificial lift, it could take between one to two years. Mm-hmm. So th- we were aware that the, that the geomechanics or that the, the, the fractural conductivity in, in the Delaware Basin could degrade pretty quickly. And that's why we, we focus on, on, on the stress data. With, so with the stress. Yeah, so how are they pulling the stress data there? It depends on, I, I would initially think of it would first depend on just the public data that you get from Zodak mm-hmm. from from the so Mark Zo, so Dr. Mark Zoback has has stress data that that's published when he does his related when he's published his regional study so we initially use that and then we go to operators if they have their own geomechanics if they have their own stress data on that mm-hmm. and then finally it, it does go back to uh, using a DFM or using a it is using a DFM that we that we found to be pretty convenient on what was traditionally used for that same formation in the in the Midland Basin, but we calibrate it by using some of the reservoir properties that are that that are that we know really well about the Delaware. Okay, so I could maybe find some of your tech papers about stress and how they think it's affecting frac growth in the south. Yes, so the frac modeling paper that we that we that we published in the 2018 
conference mm -hmm. or BRAC conference is that there the, all those references were this is how this is the these are past or tech uh, these are past papers that we've gotten our, our stress data or our assumptions from. Other than the data that you get from the actual operators, and you did mention right now the ZOBAC uh, website, wh what other sources are you getting your data from? Operators, so Dr. ZOBAC, and then I would also say, I mean, we initially started, we initially used IHS and then drilling info, but we've slowly moved away from, from, public, from, from the public data sources. So I, I, would, strong, I would suggest IHS. Okay. And what are the differences in the two, just briefly? They, why you would suggest one over the The allocation, that the, there's a difference in allocation and I would also say that I just, from what we've seen on the, um, on the Permian wells, they, they're, they update, uh, they, they're more updated compared to drilling info. More updated as in like every month they'll update their yes. data? Or? Well, it's every month, but for example, drilling info were two months out yeah. and then I just were one month out. So you get an extra month's worth of data in IHS. Any other questions?